deep sea is the largest ecosystem on the planet. It's everything from 200 meters depth all the way to the deepest point on the planet at just under 11,000 meters. And it provides the majority of habitable space on Earth, space in which life can live on this planet. The deep sea is a really extreme environment. It's dark, there's no sunlight, and the temperatures are near freezing. And then there are crushing pressures because of those thousands of meters of water above. But the life in the deep ocean is perfectly evolved and adapted to live in this wonderful part of our planet. And because of the range of habitats, there are thought to be a million species, and it is this vast repository of biodiversity. The conditions in the deep sea may be extreme, but they're also very stable. Animals move slowly, they grow slowly, they reproduce slowly, and they can live to some pretty extreme ages. So for instance, we know there are corals that live for over 4,000 years, and there are sponges that have been alive for more than 10,000 years. And so these deep sea animals, given these very long times that they take to do most of their basic functions, they don't deal well with change or disturbance. The deep sea is probably the last remaining nearly pristine environment on Earth. And that's because it's been very difficult to access. Now, as technology is advancing, we're able to go down into the deep ocean. And as we're discovering new life forms in the deep ocean, we're also realizing that there's an abundance of minerals in the deep sea. And it is these metals, these minerals, that are of interest to a new industry called deep sea mining. And it will involve destructive technology. So there are three types of habitat in the deep sea that we know are rich in minerals. And these are the hydrothermal vents. They are underwater chimneys that are very rich in, in unique biodiversity. Then there are the cobalt crusts uh, in seamounts. Seamounts are just underwater mountains. And thirdly, there are areas of the abyssal plains, so basically the vast stretches of the flat seabed uh, that we know are also rich in minerals, such as manganese, cobalt, and nickel. The deep sea mining industry is keen to get their hands on these metals. But we also know that deep sea mining will have huge impacts and could be the largest industrial activity that the ocean has ever faced. The deep sea mining industry is in its infancy and we are able to take action now. Well, deep sea bed mining in the international areas of the world's oceans is regulated by a UN body called the International Seabed Authority. It formally came into being in 1994 with the entry into force of the Law of the Sea Convention. And the ISA has 167 countries that are members of that body, plus the European Union. And they have the legal authority to decide who gets a license to mine, under what conditions those licenses are issued, and where the mining would take place. Well, no commercial mining is yet taking place. However, the International Seabed Authority has issued 31 exploration licenses covering about 1.5 million square kilometers of deep seabed. Uh, 25 of those 31 licenses are in the hands of seven countries and three corporations based in Canada, the United States, and Belgium. A lot of the focus right now is on a place called the clarion clipperton zone, which is this vast area of abyssal plain in the deep, deep ocean between Hawaii and Mexico. And there's a particular focus there because it contains vast fields of polymetallic nodules, which contain these, these rare earth metals, which is what the companies are after. This is a polymetallic nodule and they usually sit on the sea floor like cobbles on a street. And they form in a similar way to a pearl, for instance. There will be a nucleus, which can be a shark's tooth or a grain of sand. And then over millions and millions of years, metals accrete onto that and eventually grow to something around this size. This has cobalt in it, copper in it, nickel in it. 
but actually it's so much more. This is its own little habitat. We get millions of different species living on these nodules, everything from microbes, some of which live nowhere else other than on and in these nodules, all the way to much larger animals, things like anemones, sponges, corals. And some of these sponge stalks that are attached to these nodules are actually used by something called the Casper octopus, which lays its eggs on the sponge stalks and stells and then uses that as a place to brood its eggs. And that means that if the nodules were to be removed, they would certainly impact these species and potentially lead to long lasting, if not irreversible impacts to this ecosystem. So what will deep sea mining on the abyssal plain look like? So the operation will need to be conducted from a purpose-built surface vessel. And this ship will then lower a collector vessel down over the side where it can take several hours to reach the sea floor because a lot of the deep sea is around four to six kilometers deep. Once the collector vehicle gets to the seabed, it will start collecting nodules. And there are different ways in which this can be done, but it will likely involve a hydraulic mechanism to suck up the nodules. The collector vehicle essentially will operate like a large vacuum cleaner or a combine harvester, and it'll drive around mining the nodules. But during this process, it will also collect about five to 30 centimeters of sediment from the sea floor. And this will all pass through the vehicle the nodules will be retained, but the sediment will come out of the back of it. And that will create a sediment plume, a bit like an underwater sandstorm. The nodules will be pumped to the surface via a riser pipe, and there will be some sediment that also goes up. And on the surface vessel, the nodules will be cleaned. The nodules will be loaded onto a transport ship, which will then take them back to land for processing. But the unwanted sediment and seawater from the cleaning process will be released back into the ocean. And that could either happen close to the sea floor or at much shallower depths closer to the surface. And that creates a secondary plume, but this time likely containing fragments of metal. Deep sea mining is gonna be a pretty destructive process. So in the path of the mining vehicle, any animals will be crushed or killed. And then during the mining process, as the nodules are being removed themselves, that means that the habitat that many animals, in fact, hundreds of species rely on as a home. There'll be noise and light pollution on a scale that has never been seen before in the deep ocean and on which animals in the deep ocean will never have experienced. And then beyond that, during this mining process, there'll be large amounts of sediment that are being disturbed on the seafloor. And these sediment plumes can extend for tens, if not hundreds of kilometers from the actual site of activity. And that will potentially have far-reaching and long-lasting impacts in these abyssal plain ecosystems. So there have been some studies of potential mining impacts that have been done. And what these tests have shown is that the areas where they were done have not recovered after many decades of no activity. The nodules will have been removed and that means that a huge amount of species have not yet returned to the area. There is in fact lower diversity of species, lower abundance of species, and overall a functional loss in the ecosystem. And this is incredibly concerning because these nodules form at a rate of a few millimeters per millions of years. And so we will not see recovery of these ecosystems in our timescale, timescales we are used to, but it's more going to be on geological timescales for the nodules to reform and then the communities to return to what they once were. The deep ocean is a fundamental part of the climate system. It's the part of our planet that is locking away carbon dioxide to natural processes. It's the part of our planet that is actually absorbing heat and redistributing it in a conveyor belt around the planet that helps shape and form the conditions that we know of on land. On land, we know it's about soils and peatlands absorbing and capturing that carbon, which it lays down for thousands of years, perhaps longer. The ocean is no different. Sediments can also capture carbon, can also lay that down for very long periods of time, taking it out of the system. Deep sea mining 
is something that's going to interrupt those processes. We may not know all the consequences, but we know these natural processes are fundamental and important. So that's why we need to be extremely careful with making any decisions in such stable environments that disrupt these processes. So this massive ship is the hidden gem, and it's one of the vessels that will be used in deep sea mining. It will be operated by the Metals Company, which is one of the companies that is pushing for deep sea mining to go ahead in the short term. The ship is here to be refitted, and once it's ready, it will head out to the Clarion Clipperton zone in the Pacific Ocean. But what it really shows us is that deep sea mining is upon us, and the window for us to stop this destructive industry from happening is narrowing. So within the next two years, there's a very real possibility that mining will go from the exploration stage to the exploitation stage, full, full on commercial mining. Because the country of Nauru, a small island state in the South Pacific, has triggered a so-called two-year rule, which says that if mining regulations aren't in place within two years and a country says we want to mine, then the ISA either has to get those regulations in place or give a license to the company anyway. And Nauru was persuaded to trigger the two-year rule by the metals company, formerly Deep Green, the Canadian company, because that company wanted to list on the NASDAQ, on the US Stock Exchange, and needed to convince investors that one way or another, it would have a license to mine within the next few years. This idea that we need to mine the deep ocean for the benefit of humankind is ludicrous. Who stands to gain from mining these metals? It's a handful of companies, largely from the Northern Hemisphere, that will profit from this industry. I think Nauru is a victim of both history and desperation. This is a country that sees deep sea mining as its only alternative livelihood. Their vulnerability makes them quite open to being taken advantage by contractors and multinational corporations such as the metals company. For Pacific people, we see ourselves as ocean people. So the ocean is quite central to our worldview and it informs who we are uh, on the international stage. Deep sea mining is a very critical issue for Pacific Islanders today. I think what most people tend to forget is that the clariton clipperton zone is still considered within the Pacific. And so when you think about how impacts will be felt, it will be felt by those countries that are closest to the clariton clipperton zone, including you know, indigenous peoples in Hawaii, uh, Kiribati, and certainly Cook Islands and Tahiti, so I think there's, there's, there's high risk for our island states, particularly the small island states, now and into the future. If the metals company and Nauru are successful in getting the first licenses to mine, this could then open the door for any number of other countries and companies to come in and also apply for mining licenses. If that happens, and they're making money, and they're paying in royalties to the International Seabed Authority, the door is wide open and the economics will drive the expansion of that industry. There is very little that the ISA will be able to do to contain or restrain that runaway development, a gold rush, if you will, of deep sea bed mining. As the deep sea mining industry is gaining traction, uh, so too is the opposition. We're seeing environmental organizations speak out against deep sea mining. We're seeing political bodies such as the European Parliament and other countries come out against deep sea mining. Uh, we're seeing scientists come out. The over 600 scientists have signed a letter calling for a pause on this industry. And most importantly, we may not need these metals at all. We're seeing companies that are increasingly realizing that they don't need these metals from the deep ocean for their supply chains. At the BMW Group, we have the aim to have the most sustainable supply chain in the industry. This really concerns all parts that we're purchasing, but also the minerals contained therein. 
If we look at deep seabed mining, biodiversity is a key concern. There are a lot of science gaps that need to be filled. And until these questions can be answered, we refrain from using those minerals for our vehicles. Our conclusion has been to draft this business statement that as a precautionary measure, we won't use any minerals derived from the deep seabed until we understand the consequences of deep seabed mining activities. We also opened this business statement to investors in order not to um, finance deep seabed mining activities. And we're inviting other companies to also join this business statement. We don't realize it, but actually humankind relies on the deep ocean to keep the planet habitable and to keep us alive. So as it currently stands, going forward with deep sea mining on the scale on which many would like it to go forward is a mistake. The deep ocean is the least known ecosystem on the planet. And as scientists, we certainly need more time to study these poorly known environments. And by understanding them better, it will allow us to manage these ecosystems and protect these ecosystems so that we can keep them around for generations to come. When I think of the deep ocean, this amazing vast set of ecosystems beyond the jurisdiction of any country, I think we know enough to care. We are the generation with the technology. We are the generation with the data and the information to know that the, the deep ocean is fundamentally important to this planet. I hope the next generation look back and go, do you know what? They were smarter than the rest. They did the right thing and they protected the blue heart of the planet. The world doesn't need to mine the deep ocean. This is a living, breathing part of the planet which contributes to global climate cycles and planetary systems. And maybe, for once, we should just recognize that we would be better off, for the benefit of humankind as a whole, to leave it alone and recognize that we need to operate within planetary boundaries. And this would be a great place to start. <laughs>